Hi everyone, thanks for joining me for this Cloud Lunch and Learn marathon session. Um, zero to Hero, deploy with confidence using Azure DevOps. And before we get started, um, obviously just want to thank the sponsors, Microsoft and Redgate for helping to make this possible. Um, and above all, the organizers for the event who've put in a lot of uh, time and effort to organize um, all of the speakers and the moderating of all of the sessions. Um, quick introduction, so uh, my name is Martin Coupland. Um I'm a Microsoft MVP in Azure as well as uh, a MCT. Um, I'm also a DevOps ambassador with the DevOps Institute as well. Um, a lot of my background is really around um, DevOps on Azure. Um, so I day to day in my job, um, I use a lot of the tooling that we're going to be talking about and a lot of the processes that you would use to enable DevOps on Azure. <clears throat> in this session, we're going to be looking at the tooling and the methods that are available to us within Azure to deploy not just applications, but also infrastructure as well. It's really important that you understand um, with Azure DevOps that you can also deploy things like ARM templates and Terraform templates as well as your applications. So if you're practicing something like infrastructure as code, then Azure DevOps has all of the tools available to you to be able to deploy those onto your platform of choice. <clears throat> First of all, I just want to go through some um, bits that, that talk about what Azure DevOps is and, and what tool is available to us for, for those who do not understand um, or, or have not worked with the tool set before and, and want to know a little bit more about it. So, First of all, I just want to take a, a higher view. So when it comes to your company uh, and the innovation within your company, developers are really at the heart of that innovation, um, especially in the modern world, okay? And the, there's a saying that every company is a software company, uh, and no more is that true than, than today. Most organizations write software of some kind or write automation to help their infrastructure teams or help their application teams deploy what they need to. So it's really, really important that we make sure that we understand how to increase productivity and how to accelerate that collaboration. If we think about what DevOps actually is, it's around increasing those two things, productivity and collaboration. Those are the things that we call DevOps culture. So being able to increase those and, and being able to understand them better is really fundamental to how we enable those things to happen at a greater pace in the future and, and get our organization to that next level. So I wanna read you this quote first of all. So this quote's from Donovan Brown, um, who's DevOps manager at, at Microsoft. This is a, a quote that he come up with. Uh, and the quote is that DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to your end users. Now, I personally really, really like this quote for a number of reasons. First and foremost, we don't talk about technology. We talk about product, and that's what DevOps is, is all about. And we don't talk about delivering software or delivering technology. We talk about delivering value. And fundamentally, that is what it always comes down to. It's not really about the tools. It never really is about the tools. It is about the value that you deliver to your end users. This quote could actually apply to many organizations. It doesn't have to be technology. There's a lot of uh, organizations that practice elements of DevOps without having software engineering teams. And it really is, again, I said it a couple of times already, it's around driving the right value to your end users. Whatever value that is in your business, it's about driving that into the right place, meaning that features and functionality uh, are delivered as quickly as possible with the highest quality. And it is the people and the process that make those things happen effectively. So when it comes to the tools available to us on the Microsoft ecosystem, specifically around Azure, we will always say that Azure is a cloud with DevOps tooling built in. What do we mean by that? Let's go into a little bit more detail and find out what we mean. So first of all, 
from the development side, you can see at the top of the diagram there, we talk about the IDEs, the development environments. We talk about Visual Studio, Visual Studio Code, the lighter version, which I'm sure many of you use day to day already, as well as GitHub. GitHub is obviously owned by Microsoft now, and that is now part of that same ecosystem. <coughs> Excuse me. In our day to day, um, in my job, where I build a, a cloud management platform um, for, for a managed service provider. We use GitHub to store our source code, but we use other Azure tooling, such as Azure DevOps, to be able to process them and to be able to take them to the next level and to be able to really take what we're doing and deploy it through pipelines and run our tests through there effectively. And we manage our work through boards. That's all down in the deliver section in the bottom right-hand corner there. Azure DevOps has a number of different features within it to be able to do all of those things in one product. There isn't a need to go off into different products to do these things. It is all within one tool itself. And this is what makes it a powerful solution. Move across to operate now. Once you've delivered and it's time to operate, how do you make sure that your platform and your application is performing as expected? Well, things like Azure Monitor will help tell us telemetry and insights as well as application insights that can feed into Azure Monitor. Things like Azure Policy will help us with governance and management of the platform as well as Azure Automation. And then from a security perspective, there is obviously Azure Security Center on top of there, which will enable us to go that step further. And that step further for us is having the ability to have security telemetry also feed into what we do operationally. Things can come out of here and go back into the develop stage where we can pick these things up and run with them again in future sprints. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's look at pipelines in a little bit more detail. Quite a lot of people are often confused by what pipelines mean. Pipeline is basically a workflow. It runs a number of steps in sequence. It runs a number of processes for us to generate a result. In DevOps, we generally have two types of pipelines. Those pipelines are CI pipelines, continuous integration pipelines, that are responsible for building our source code into a deliverable artifact. And then CD, continuous delivery or continuous deployment. And continuous deployment pipelines rather are really more of a way of taking what has been built by the CI pipeline and executing that to a destination of our choice. Within the environment I work in, it's, this is our source code that is built in terms of a .NET Core application. <coughs> Excuse me. It is built as a .NET Core application. And it is picked up at, at the end of there where it does testing, various other bits and pieces and some security scanning and static analysis. And then it takes it and deploys it to application services all within Azure. And that happens in less than five minutes. So I can go from committing code in our repository to those changes being reflected on the live application in a matter of minutes. There is no picking it up, running through manual deployment steps, doing various bits and pieces in various different areas. It is all done for us automatically. And we can use other bits of technology in Azure as well, in app services to enable things like A-B testing green and, and blue deployments and canary-based deployments as well. All of those features are available to us. <coughs> Excuse me. One of the great things about Azure Pipelines as well is the support for not only Windows, but also Mac OS and also Linux. Whatever code you bring to Azure DevOps, Azure DevOps has the ability to build and release it onto any platform using any language and also any cloud. While predominantly Certainly my experience is around deploying to Azure. You can also deploy to things like Google Cloud uh, and also AWS as well, right from the same um, portal. It's the same experience. It's exactly the same as what you see on the screen there. It doesn't look any different. And it's really easy for us to be able to deploy to somewhere different based on different conditions. You can use the pipeline to be able to take what you've got 
and based on different conditions of the build, deploy it to somewhere different. You can also deploy it to containers and Kubernetes clusters as well. This enables you to build your images through your pipelines and then deploy them straight up to a container registry. There's a little bit more on that coming a little bit later on. <coughs> the pipeline that you see here is a release pipeline. So whereas in the previous screenshot we looked at build pipelines, this is a release pipeline. And this is taking source code as an artifact and it is taking it through various different stages. One of the great things you can see about this pipeline is it is not environment specific. There are stages within this pipeline to be able to deploy to the development environment, the QA environment and the production environment. And there's also a section called performance as well, uh, where you might do uh, things like SIT testing or other types of load testing. As we said, you could deploy to any platform. If you wanted to, you could even deploy to uh, on-premises data centers, also as a stack through here as well. You can deploy build agents instead of running them virtually and then being hosted by Microsoft. You can host those on-premises on your own servers. <coughs> those agents could even be on Azure VMs as scale sets as well, so that you can take advantage of accessing resources on your um, physical network or, or anywhere within your cloud network. What's great about them as well is if they're deployed privately in your own um, Azure environment, they will scale up and down depending on the load that is put on them and the demand that is needed. So if part of your process involves running tasks that need connectivity to on-premises systems, you can still use Azure DevOps. You can still use the tooling that we're talking about here. Part of the process is around pre and post deployment as well. Um, so on the diagram there, you can just see at the beginning of the stages, there's two little icons. There's one of a, a lightning bolt and one of a user. Those are pre-deployment conditions and approvals. They are effectively gates that let you specify rules around what gets approved and who needs to approve it. This could be going off to a tool like ServiceNow. It could literally be sending off an approvement email to a nominated list of people to be able to approve that deployment. What's really good about that is it involves full traceability of exactly what's happening all along the process. You can have post conditions on there as well, which would let you do various different things like taking different branches within your um, process. It will also let you um, perform pro uh, sorry post deployment tasks around validation of what's been built and to what specific environment. There's lots of things that you can do using the tooling that is available to you. <coughs> Next is around what we can do as an end-to-end -end solution. So just thinking a, a level further up from Azure DevOps for a second. Most of the customers that use Microsoft technology are enterprise customers and one of the things that that demands of us is the ability to be compliant and be secure lots of organizations have a huge focus on security at the minute and the ability to be secure and be compliant while deployed continuously ha has a big focus and that is something that we're we're going to cover now so from a governance level the ability to use things like Azure policy and blueprints to proactively apply policies that are defined and enable compliant releases really takes a lot of the process that you might usually be used to from manual deployments away from there and put them directly into automated deployments. That's a really important thing to consider because with Azure policy, you define your rules once, apply them to a specific scope, and then whatever you deploy within the scope of that policy will automatically inherit the rules that are defined in policy. Policy can be any number of things, anything from just mandating tags or on specific resources, all the way through to the configuration of, of certain items and certain resources. It really is a top to bottom solution for making sure that you are compliant with your corporate policies. <clears throat> Next is around security. So with tools like Advanced Threat Protection in Azure Security Center, um, which is a, is, is a costed add-on, uh, and lots of the other features within Azure Security Center, 
Those features enable us to get a really good rounded view from a security perspective of exactly what is happening in our environment and how our application is interacting from a security perspective. We could obviously feed those security details <coughs> into a number of different tools, tools such as Log Analytics and, and then into uh, Azure Sentinel to get some really deep diagnostic information around security. <coughs> if you are using containers, Azure Security Center performs vulnerability scanning of your containers as well. So you get a good idea from a security perspective what you are releasing into your environment. If you think about this being done through a pipeline process automatically, which we'll talk about in a, in a minute, um, this is something that can, can really drive you forward in terms of maturity within your organization. And it's something that means that you can automate your process top to bottom and still take into account things like security and governance, which are ever so important in organizations today. Next is around resiliency. So if you are releasing applications on virtual machines, uh, instead of them being cloud native, or you are deploying virtual machines through Azure, it's important to make sure that some of those virtual machines are highly available and that the virtual machines are protected from an application and a data perspective. So using tools like Azure Backup to maintain uh, the availability of, of system and application critical files on those VMs, and things like Azure Site Recovery to provide high availability to additional regions, you can configure and, and consult, uh, consolidate all of those configuration um, configuration steps down into your automation workflow and really make sure that you are putting all of these things in from the from the outset. Again, these are things that can be done automatically uh, using things like PowerShell, using things like the uh, REST API, um, which Microsoft have for Azure, <coughs> and various other um, methods of scripting that you could use on your virtual machines. Next is around monitoring. So Azure Monitor is a hugely rich tool that provides deep insights on a number of different facets. When we talk about monitoring, I always like to talk about three things. There's performance, availability, and security. For me, those are the three key elements that you should be monitoring when it comes to um, any of your applications in your infrastructure. Is it performing well? Is it available? And is it secure? Using Azure Monitor, you can get all of those three metrics uh, collected together and reported on in one place so that you can get those deep operational insights backed up with actual data and intelligence that tells you exactly where things are and where things need to be in the future. You can use those to then automate using Azure Automation. You can update your um, non-compliant items to bring them in line to compliance. You can change the configuration of some of your systems to make sure that they are up to date with the latest patches using update management within Azure Automation. <coughs> you can also react to alerts using Azure Automation as well. Alerts that come in through Azure Monitor, you can simply go in and create actions for them to be updated in Azure Automation itself. So from an enterprise perspective, when it comes to security, monitoring and management services, they are all available in the platform out of the box for you to be able to use, consume, and make sure that you are able to still deploy continuously and in a compliant manner. Next, I wanna talk about some scenarios. <laughs> so the scenario I want to talk about is uh, deploying your source code um, out of GitHub, creating container images from them, putting those up into a, an AKS, Kubernetes cluster, and some of the best practices uh, around them and some of the things that this tool set can enable for us. First is around code security. So it's no secret that when it comes to practicing DevSecOps, the whole idea is around uh, shift left as a mentality. And that shift left mentality really gives us the ability to have other people look at security as far left as possible. And in the scenario of code, that is our developers. So we want to make sure our code is as secure as possible 
at the earliest possible opportunity. So you can use things like CodeQL, um, which is GitHub Advanced Security. You can also use tools like Dependabot to identify and remediate any issues with any third party libraries or dependencies that are used within your code. As developers, we use third party libraries all the time. So you you be used to things like NuGet and Chocolatey as package management tools. Developers use them all the time. We want to make sure that our developer users, our developers, sorry, are using approved libraries that are um, free from infection, uh, are free from malicious code, and from a licensing perspective, are safe for us to use. So Dependabot lets us identify what those. Um, dependencies are. It'll also remediate any issues for us in there as well. Another important thing is around secret scanning. We never want credentials leaking into built applications in any environment, be that production or development environments. We want the ability to scan our code for those credentials when they're committed into source control. And that's exactly what GitHub can do. Secret and credential scanning will look for uh, patterns of secrets and, and credentials that are stored in code and it will flag them up uh, as part of the pull request process so that you can pick them up and, and as part of your code review process you'll be able to deal with them before they are committed into code. And that's a powerful feature uh, and one that will make a bit more sense when we talk about Key Vault in, in a few steps time. So we've already talked about continuous integration and continuous delivery. So Azure Pipelines will give us the ability to build those production ready container images with full traceability. We're able to track back all commits, all work items, and all artifacts of every image that we build. That means that whenever we make a commit of code, we can link them into the work items in Azure Boards, which determine exactly what work we are doing within the environment, what work we are scheduled to be doing, and what, <coughs> what commits made up those elements of source code. So we have that level of traceability, which tells us who did that, when it was done, and what lines of code were changed to enable that functionality to happen. Roll forward into the pipeline, and uh, once the build and release is finished, we also get traceability back from a release perspective for us to be able to determine who's done what and when they were actually released. So that end-to-end -end traceability is really, really important. It's something we can look back on later in time to say, uh, not from a finger pointing perspective, uh, far from it. This is more of a, um, why did we do this at the point we did it? Why did we do this a certain way? Um, we did it a certain way for this and we can point to that evidence and that evidence is automatically collected for us when we're using the tool set. I mentioned container image uh, scanning in Security Center. So when you're using container registries in Azure, um, ACR, as well as integrating them with Security Center, <coughs> excuse me, your containers are automatically scanned for vulnerabilities you get that report back in Security Center with your image uh, name and the number of vulnerabilities and a list of them. If you want, you can make calls to Security Center to pull out that information and you could even log them as bugs on the developer's backlog if that's something that you wanted to do. But those conditions can be looked at as part of the release process. Once the container image is built and uploaded, we could then interrogate a Security Center before continuing our process to say, do we actually want to deploy this tool or do we want to pause it there because we found something that's not quite right. Next is around the service itself. And this is where we kind of start to link into infrastructure from developer centric technologies really. <coughs> Excuse me. So in Azure, we run um, containers generally are on AKS, Azure Kubernetes Service. So we can deploy directly to those clusters from the pipeline. We can utilize things like infrastructure as code solutions, be those ARM templates, they could be Terraform. It could even be a PowerShell script. As well as integrate with Azure policy to ensure high levels of compliance. 
Kubernetes now has the Azure policy service available to it to ensure container level uh, and cluster level uh, compliance of set policies from a security perspective. That gives you confidence that you are deploying your secure code onto a secure platform. That means that everything is tied up in one place. And tying everything up in one place and knowing you have a secure application backed up by secure infrastructure is really, really important. And it is something that is fundamental to how we work when it comes to this sort of technology. I mentioned credential scanning and, and storing secrets. So Azure Key Vault does exactly that. Azure Key Vault is a place where we can store all of our keys, certificates, tokens, connection strings, and any other secrets. And applications will call them at runtime. That's a much safer solution than including them in code. The reason for that is quite simple. What if we had a solution where we needed to generate a connection string for a SQL database. We don't want anyone to ever know what those credentials are. We could have a script to generate them automatically for an assigned SQL server. We could put those credentials directly into Key Vault and we could return the secret name. That secret name can then be referred to in code and then it is called at runtime. That's a great solution because that means no one ever knows what the username or password is for connecting to that system and then it is stored directly as a connection string within Azure Key Vault. That is probably the most secure solution you can get. That security means that your developers don't know local credentials to systems. It means that they have to follow the processes that you've set out to be able to connect to them. Those are really, really powerful things that enable you to do a number of different things. Key Vault also supports the storing of recovery keys for encryption on virtual machines. Um, it supports the ability to put certificates in there as well. Uh, you can assign expiration dates to them as well, run automation around there. You could store keys for any number of things or any number of secrets within your application. The possibilities are, are really are endless when it comes to Key Vault and having that ability <coughs> excuse me, having that ability to store those sensitive application uh, secrets, connection strings and tokens in a secure place so that no one knows what they are. If they're stored in there from the outset and referred to by their name, there is no risk of them then leaking into committed code. So that's a really powerful solution that enables us to be as secure as possible from the outset. Next is around authentication. Now, authentication and authorization really are the cornerstones of security when it comes to applications. You can use Azure AD as well as um, Azure AD uh, B2C for consumer-based applications. Advanced features such as multi-factor authentication, the detailed activity reporting that's available to make sure that your application is secure. The car management platform I'm developing enables our users to log in with their um, Azure AD accounts. These are business accounts. It means that we don't need to manage authentication um, for any of our users. It can be managed by their parent tenant. So the organization they represent manages that identity. If they leave the organization, the organization simply disables their account and they can then no longer log into our application. This uses a process called OAuth. It's a well-established process of authentication. It's used by uh, many, many different popular uh, websites to access their APIs. And you can also use that to secure your APIs as well. I do the same in my application. Our API is secured using app registrations from Azure AD and calls to there are authenticated using the bearer authentication scheme. So you need to require a token, and that token needs to be valid um, for the application that you're calling, and then you need to pass that token along to your API calls for them to be successful. That's a really powerful thing to enable us to do. Next is around Azure Monitor. So Azure Monitor, as we've already discovered, from both an application and an infrastructure perspective, 
enables us in near real time to be able to look at telemetry, collect and monitor that telemetry. Put that into a pipeline scenario. You can use them around automatic approval gates. That's a really important point. If we use them for our deployments, that then means that we can look at telemetry that is collected as part of our release process. And if the quality gate is not met by the telemetry that we've collected, we are then simply able to roll back our deployment based on the result of monitoring. That means that if we deploy something and we start picking up HTTP 500 errors, for instance, we can instantly roll back that deployment to the last known good configuration. Effectively, we can roll back to the last release that was successful and then we can look at what's caused those problems and fix them for next time. The result of that is that we are not causing downtime to the application. It's as minimal as it can be, and we are automatically providing that rollback. And that automatic rollback means that we minimize the impact to any of our customers using the application. It also means that we limit the amount of time that the application is unavailable for. This allows us to get better set metrics in DevOps, like mean time to resolution, which is the amount of time it takes for us to um, recover from a failure up to the application working again. And those are really key metrics that it's important to, to understand and look at. To leave you with, I want to leave you with links to um, three really great resources. <clears throat> so the first one um, on the left there is the Azure DevOps Labs. So on this site is a huge amount of information around exactly um, how you can use Azure DevOps for very specific and certain scenarios. So if you are looking to implement a specific part of Azure DevOps or run a specific scenario in Azure DevOps, then you can look at the Azure DevOps Labs website and you will be able to get some detailed information about how to set those things up. And there's some tips and tricks for things that you might not have considered along the way as well. Um, in the middle is a link to my blog. Um, please do have a look. Um, I, I generally post a, a lot about uh, DevOps and also deployments on Azure as well. Um, there's some code samples up there. There's some articles around uh, thought leadership around the implementation of DevOps itself. Um, so there's a, a wide variety of content up there. And then finally, the Azure DevOps Demo Generator. Now, if you're looking to get started, especially with pipelines and you're not sure where to start, um, then go to the Azure DevOps Demo Generator. This will let you create numerous different um, scenarios which you can then start to demonstrate um, within your own tenant. You can log in and it will let you deploy Azure DevOps demos to your environment that you can then look at, you can play with, uh, you can fine tune, um, you can get working exactly as you want. And because those pipelines are controlled through uh, YAML, um, you can basically export them and put them into your production environment if you want. So there's some really good resources there to help you get more familiar with the tooling that we've talked about throughout the presentation. So basically that leads me to say uh, thank you for uh, watching the session. Uh, I hope you learned something and can take that away um, into, <coughs> excuse me, into your um, organization. And there's plenty of food for thought there that you can think about. Um, don't forget to check out the, the hashtag for the event, CLL Marathon, um, on Twitter. There, there'll be lots of content on there around the other event, uh, sorry, the other sessions that are on today and from the other speakers. And hopefully you've enjoyed uh, and hopefully you enjoy the rest of the sessions that you are attending. So with that, again, I'd like to say thank you and speak to you all soon.